this special meeting of the King County Board of Health for June 15th, 2020 to order. Madam Clerk, um, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Board Member Colwells. Here. Board Member Lambert. Here. Board Member Dembowski. Here if needed. Board Member Lewis. Board Member Morales. Board Member Mosqueda. Board Member Baker. Board Member Honda. Honda's raising her hand and looking for her mute button, I think. <laughs> <laughs> unmute. Okay, here. Thank it you. Wouldn't unmute. Thank you. Sorry. Board Member Zahn. Here if needed. Board Member Daniel. Here. Board Member Delecky. Here. Mr. Chair. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Are there alternates serving in the place of regular members? I believe that I'm serving um, as an alternate to David Baker, who's not here. The council member is, on, is, serve, is in the, ser, serving as a um, voting member in the place of Mayor Baker. Madam Clerk, any others? Not that I know of. So, all right, thank you. As we begin today, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional lands of the Puget Salish peoples, past and present. We want to thank the caretakers of the land who've lived here and continue to live here since time immemorial. I'd also like to acknowledge the, the many urban Indians in King County who have brought their cultural ways of life here and greatly enriched our community. Um, we'll begin with the chair's report, and I want to acknowledge and thank everybody for their flexibility in having this special meeting today. Um, as we discussed last week, the Board of Health has a specific role in approving King County's application to move into phase two of um, the safe, state's Safe Start Plan. And Dr. Jeff Dushin, our health director, is recommending that King County submitted an application for phase two. At this time. It is the intent of the county to submit that application this week. Um, and thus the special meeting today to be able to consider the application. Um, I also wanna note that we'll, we will be meeting on Thursday of this week for our regularly scheduled meeting where, where we will continue the conversation we began last week um, and work together um, regarding racism as a public health crisis. Before we move to our discussion about moving in phase two today, I wanna to make sure that you've all seen the updated application materials. As I said um, in the Zoom call before we began the meeting, um, the current um, and final application was emailed to board members at 3.42 p.m. from Susan Levy, our board administrator. Um, and we will, um, as we consider the resolution today, we will be amending to attach this version to the resolution itself. Um, but I wanted to direct everyone to that if you haven't already seen the final version in your email. With that, um, we'll move to item five, um, the resolution itself, resolution 2009. Madam Clerk, would you please read it into the record? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item five is resolution number 20-09, a resolution supporting King County's application to the Washington State Department of Health to enter phase two of the Safe Start Reopening Plan. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce our panelists um, to present on the application. They are Rachel Smith, the Deputy Execu County Executive for King County, um, Kirsten um, Wisen, the Policy Analyst with Public Health, Seattle King County, and Dennis Worsham, the Prevention Division Director with Public Health, Seattle King County. Um, panelists, I don't know if you've decided in what order you'll be speaking, but the um, screen is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rachel Smith, uh, Deputy County Executive and Chief of Staff here at King County. I'm gonna kick us off and keep uh, my remarks uh, sort of short and then uh, next we'll hand it over to Kirsten. Um, so I'm gonna do a little just stage setting here, if you will. Um, you know, I think it's important to start this conversation um, as we have had a number uh, similar to this that you know we are all very united right now in terms of our businesses and our workers and our community groups and our families really to get into 
to get them back to school, to get them back to recreating and generating economic activity and doing all of that really as quickly as possible. Um, and we stand committed to continuing to do that today. I also want to take a quick step back and remind us, um, you know, as we are thinking about our slow steps to reopening, um, you know, in relation to the rest of the state, it really is important to remember that we were the first, we were the epicenter. Um, we have had at one time the dubious distinction of having the most cases, of having the most outbreaks and having the most deaths. Most deaths. Um, but everyone in this community really rallied behind, uh, uh, behind the direction from public health. They rallied to bend the curve. And um, because of the efforts of this community, we really did bend the curve and um, have nearly kind of caught up with the rest of the state in terms of seeing a reduction in the amount of disease activity. Um, and I just honestly say this is a testament to our community and to all of you who helped lead it. Um, I want to say thank you. Uh, and I'm excited today to actually spend our time being able to talk about the go forward and the go forward uh, towards that joint goal uh, of us being able to re -get, uh, you know, add to our economic activity that we've begun. Um, so quickly, I'm going to walk through kind of just the status of the numbers and the current public health thinking, the quick uh, next steps on how we're getting there, and then turn it over to Kirsten Weissen, who's going to walk through the details of our application. And then, of course, Dennis, we have here with us as well. Um, and then the other reminder, again, or the other piece of context for stage setting that I want to put out there is um, that everything that we're talking about today is within the framework that has been articulated by the state of Washington, both the Department of Health and the governor's office. So the phases, the sectors, the guidance, that whole frame, um, the work that we're putting forward today fits within that and is in coordination with that. Uh, so uh, I think many of you have seen um, and had a take, chance to take a look at the uh, sort of key indicators board that uh, King County Public Health has put forward. We have a lot of data on our dashboards, but this key indicators boards has three areas that we've been tracking very closely. The first is COVID activity. The second is testing. And the third is hospital readiness. And I'm going to talk about each of those uh, very briefly. So the COVID-19 activity metrics are kind of a mix of red and green. Testing is still kind of in the red and hospital readiness metrics are currently green. So uh, diving into the COVID-19 activity, specifically our COVID uh, case numbers. Um, so that number that we have uh, been trying to reach as a goal in terms of the number of cases, um, our count has been hovering right around the standard that has been set, set both by King County Public Health and Department of Health, which is 25 cases per 100,000 individuals, and we are very encouraged by that. Um, some of the things that public health has been monitoring, though, is the sort of unevenness of those numbers um, and really watching to see how recent activity is landing, if you will. And by that, I mean there's been a lot of increased activity leading up to phase two, um, obviously, we have seen protesting and other demonstrations around all of our communities. And then, of course, um, with summer and the warmer weather, people are just getting out and about more. Uh, so, so public health has been watching those numbers very closely. The uh, second number I would flag is uh, the reproductive rate, or the r not, um, whatever you call it, has gone up slightly. And I just want to say a couple of words about that, uh, doing my best job to ch channel Dr. Jeff Duchin. Um, because of our low uh, number of cases, small blips um, in those numbers can sort of more dramatically change the reproductive rate. And um, it is also important to remember that that number represents uh, data from a few weeks back. And then finally, it is a model um, and models are based on assumptions. And one of the assumptions, of course, is that testing is uniform across our community. And, and of course, um, in reality, testing is dynamic and fluid and changes. Um, and I think uh, just sort of pivoting off that, the second set of metrics is around testing. Um, and before I talk about those, I want to I want to pause for just a moment. Um, and I think it's important to flag that you know when we look at all of these metrics, our approach to them is not passive. It is in fact very active. We look at the places where we have lagging um, activity and ask ourselves what tool can we bring to. Um, you know, try to move those dials in the right direction. Um, what action can we take to get things moving? Um, what can we do to drive that metric? So in the case of the COVID 
uh, uh, activity and sort of cases, some of the things that we've done, for example, are put in the mask directive. So that was a public health directive, having folks wear masks, that's gonna help us drive that case number down. Um, and then of course, also continuing our education around social distancing, um, hand washing, um, et cetera. So those are the kinds of tools that we use to approach um, that uh, sort of piece of the metric. On testing, um, where our numbers are still uh, uh, not looking exactly as we want them, um, you know, the state has been working very hard, has gotten significantly more test kits that are now being uh, deployed around the state. The um, uh, guidance on who can get tested has been modified by the state, allowing for more individuals to get tested. Um, Seattle, who's been a, a city of Seattle, has been a very good partner in this, has set up more testing locations. Um, we're seeing generally that people are having more access to testing than they did before. And, um, you know, just to give an example of that, uh, Dr. Duchin said today, the sort of royal we in the testing space have performed about 6,000 more tests this week than we did last through, um, you know, pop-up testing, uh, more clinics, uh, mobile testing, and things like that because of the increased activity. And then the last set of metrics that I'll just flag um, that are really in the green, and this is our healthcare system. And, um, you know, again, quoting Dr. Duchin, perhaps is the most uh, single most important factor. Um, you know, we are well prepared at this point to be able to take care of our COVID-19 cases in our healthcare system uh, alongside the other healthcare needs of our community. So feeling like we are in good shape uh, with those numbers. The other things that I will just flag that we keep an eye on in public health and uh, our team can talk more about this is of course case contacting. Uh, so contact tracing um, and, and keeping, uh, keeping in communication with folks. Um, we're getting closer and closer in having the capacity to do uh, what we want to do there. And then of course the high risk facility outbreak. So um, I know folks have heard a lot about this. So uh, long-term care facilities, um, uh, you know, homeless shelters, things like that, really making sure that we don't have those kinds of outbreaks in those vulnerable populations. Um, and we have seen those numbers decrease as well. The last thing I'll flag on the numbers is that, um, you know, it really is the combination of looking at all of these metrics. There is not a single number that would drive Dr. Duchin's decision here or the executive's decision. And so um, it, it is really looking at all of them in concert. Uh, so, uh, sort of bringing us now to where we are today, um, you know, we have had the opportunity since moving to phase 1.5, which was kind of a midpoint um, between two phases. Uh, so, we have had the opportunity to see how the recent activity that I mentioned earlier has begun to land um, in terms of the numbers, and so far, so good. Uh, we have not seen a major uptick in people showing symptoms or getting tested or testing positive. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have actually, as Dr. Dujana said, kind of leveled out in terms of our numbers, perhaps not quite as low as we would generally like to see them, but that leveling out has happened and it has happened satisfactorily uh, hovering right near that target. Uh, so therefore, and this is sort of the punchline for all of this, um, the health folks, including Dr. Duchin, are now comfortable with us moving to phase two, which is, of course, the purpose of the conversation today that the chair, Chair McDermott, has convened. Um, the, you know, one caveat I would just sort of put to all of this, we have proceeded extremely cautiously through phase one, through phase 1.5, and into phase two, and all the uncertainties will remain as we move into phase two. All of the activity that we have been so diligent about doing in terms of social distancing and mask wearing and being safe around others, we have to double down on that now. The more activity that is happening, the more cautious we need to be. And so um, I think some of you may have heard the executive say before, this needs to be a one-way trip out of the extreme social distancing. And so that that caution has served us well in seeing our numbers. And so uh, we want to we want to proceed with caution as we move to uh, uh, move into phase two. Uh, so with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Kirsten to go through the application and uh, thank you all very much for the opportunity to address you today. And I'm happy to take any questions as well. Thank you. Any questions from Ms. Smith before um, Kirsten walks us through the application itself? Ms. Weissen? Thank you so much. Uh, my name's Kirsten Weissen. I've been a policy analyst in the policy shop at Public Health Seattle 
King County in the director's office for uh, coming up on 23 years. Um, and I did help write the phase one application as well as the phase two application. Um, in all honesty, Rachel did such a nice summary of our situation and our applications. I, I don't wanna take too long to walk you through the application. Um, you did receive an updated version. Um, and I might just point out two spots um, some of this work uh, is just a question of getting the most recent data included in the report. Um, so we've caught two spots that we actually want to make a slight correction before we send it into the State of um, State Department of Health um, that I just want to make sure you're aware of. Um, and I'm going to walk through the application as um, has been sent. If it would help anybody, I could share my screen, but I can also just tell you what page I'm on. Um, I'll share my screen. We're supposed to be technologically savvy here. Um, so you did receive an updated application uh, about 340 this afternoon. Um, this is an application for our county to move into a full phase two. And I'm only gonna walk you through the uh, indicators so that you're aware of um, where we are and um, how we're doing in King County. And as I said, Rachel um, walked through those really well. Uh, some of this work is just documenting and capturing some of the amazing, um, you know, we've been careful and we've also been extremely diligent and we have responded to where we've seen outbreak. And uh, this royal we is everybody who works for Dennis Warsham in the communicable disease section, as well as for Dr. Duchin. They're just amazing staff. So you can see we're um, not, we're seeing a good low number of cases per 100,000 residents, which is fantastic. Um, we are seeing this little bit, um, maybe a blip. It's still in our confidence intervals for the reproductive number at 1.2. Um, we've seen the number of people hospitalized really going down, which is fantastic. Uh, we've really seen testing go up, up, up. So um, these testing measures, we were not uh, green in the last application, but we are right now. Um, we're at 57.2, which is a well above where we need to be at 50. Um, we're really getting the test results very quickly within um, two days. Uh, let's the hospital capacity and Dr. Duchin always emphasizes this is really good. Um, we have a 69.7 occupancy in our hospital bed, so they would be ready for any unforeseen surge. We have 2% of our patients in our hospitals with COVID, which is a really nice low number. Um, and uh, you, of course, we're going to be living with COVID here for a few months, so we just need to learn how to do it. Um, we're reaching our cases th through our contact tracing. We're reaching our contacts within two days. Uh, one thing that is in development of public health is our ability to reach out and connect with our both our cases and our contacts on a daily basis. Um, but we're actively building the capacity to be able to do that by early July. And we have a pilot test in place right now. Uh, DOH has just been such a tremendous partner for us in helping us with both cases and contact tracing um, in the interim as we get our capacity up to speed. And you can see this positive good trend in the number of outbreaks at long-term care facilities, homeless shelters, and workplaces going down. Um, so that is the big picture. That's where we are. Phase two will allow a lot of our indoor limits to double. So stores used to be at 15% of occupancy, they'll go to 30. Our restaurants um, are at indoor capacity of 25%, they'll go to 50. That's kind of the, the general pattern for phase two. Um, I do think that Dr. Duchin provides a context for phase two, which is it's a much smaller change for us than it was for when we went to a modified phase one. So this is kind of a small change and our numbers are looking really good. Um, and let me just um, flag for you that you will see a couple um, very small edits. One of them is a typo that we've just, we're typing and trying to update these numbers so fast. Um, but here on, um, for you all, page three, we just have a repeating sentence. Um, both of the testing metrics are actually being met, both testing 
targets are met. So we're gonna delete this typo. Both of the testing metrics were close to being met. That's on page three, this will be deleted. Um, and then the very Ms. last- Yeah. Um, you're beating council member Lambert. Um, her specialty is finding typos and things buried in documents. So I'm sure council board member Lambert would have called this to our attention had you not. I can't beat council member Lambert at anything. <laughs> Compliment. Um, and the on page 11, we just didn't quite catch that um, we should have repeated this 1.7 um, so that the number of days between that when someone has in illness onset and when they get their test results should be 1.7. And on page 11, um, blah, 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 we, we had four in there, which is our old number and we, do, we will need to update that. Um, but that is, the, um, so here, it, this should be 1.7 days at the top of page 11. Um, I'd really love to, um, Dennis Warsham, no one better to answer questions from all of you um, and may wanna add something, um, but um, that ends my report. Thank you. Um, board members, questions for Ms. Weissen? Before we hear from Mr. Worsham. Lambert. Board Member Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, now I have you. I'm glad you were no, I have good glasses. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good job, Kristen. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was, it was good reading. Um, so I have two questions. Um, I'm very concerned that, you know, restaurants are now at 50% and there's a lot more talking and such in a restaurant than there would be in a store. And for and I've written public health several times saying that in the cities that are less than 10,000 people, having only 15 and now 30% of the store is not enough. Um, so it should be, in my mind, for the little tiny stores, it should be up to 100%, but it should at least be what the restaurants are. Why are we still containing the little stores at such a small percentage and harming them when they have almost no cases in their communities to start with. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you would indulge, I'm happy to answer that question for the council member. Nice to see you, Council Member Lambert. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, one of the things that I was trying to sort of say in the context here, you know, we are, we are required at this point to work within the frame that the state has set forward in terms of the percentages and the phases. Um, you know, when we were uh, in the phase one to 1.5, there was a little more sort of negotiating space, space I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, but now that we are uh, moving, and, and to be clear, that was negotiating space below what was in phase two, not above it. Um, and so where we uh, stand today is that we are applying for the maximum allowed under the phase two um, council members. So um, as always, you know, when you and others um, and, you know, this issue has come up with um, some of our Sound Cities Association partners as well, we always carry that feedback back to the state, both in terms of um, state agencies, DOH and the governor's office and have shared that. But right now we are uh, we are at the upper limits of the confines of what we can do in phase two. And I don't know if Dennis or Kirsten, you want to add anything to that, but. So Mr. Chair, I'd like to add to that. It would be really helpful. And I'm glad the cities have been as clear to sound cities as they have been with me um, on how they feel about this, um, especially in light of many large groups being around and not having um, a huge increase in caseload. To add an addendum here saying that the governor should consider even before the 30 days that the very small um, businesses be able to open um, because we are going to lose them. And then we will have a huge problem. And it's just very sad. And so if you could add an addendum to say, please consider changing this in the very small ones. And then the other question I had is in looking at the chart of where all the testing sites are, there is nothing beyond, um, beyond the Lake Washington. Um, there's nothing in Bellevue. There's nothing which is central, central county, and there's nothing east county. Why 
why only in the western part of the county have they been listed and not the central or the eastern part of the county? Um, most of the tests are actually done by private physician offices and hospitals. Um, you know, very relatively few are um, listed on our low cost and no cost testing sites. I know at least a couple of them are mobile, um, but you do raise an excellent point that it might be nice to have some low cost free testing sites or events or mobile on the east side. And Council Member, I will also add to that that in some, uh, Seattle has actually funded directly some of the sites in Seattle. So those have not been paid for by King County. Um, but that being said, the executive has also asked and Dennis and his team and I have been working together on this to do more expansive testing and um, and to look at it, not just in the um, sort of like you go to your provider or you go to the testing site, but also saying, you know, in the case of employers, um, large employers or things like that, are there things that we can do? So we're um, putting some putting some thinking to that right now, because I think um, you and the executive and probably many on this call uh, share the desire to be getting in and doing as much testing as we can, both to reveal what may be actually going on in the community to also um, show us where we can be doing things safely and three, just for people's own health uh, to make sure that they're getting care if they need it, if they're testing positive without symptoms. I will tell you people, Central County and Eastern County are looking at the chart and saying, who cares about me? So I think having it clearly on here would be helpful for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you everybody for the hard work. Thank you, um, Council Mem Board Member Lambert. Board Member Dimbowski. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to Rachel <clears throat> and the Public Health Department for your work on this. Uh, I think I have three questions. The first is regarding the uh, chart that has the resources on our assessment and quarantine sites. Uh, Leo Flora, our Director of uh, Community and Human Services and the Executive's Office confirmed to my office in late May around the 22nd that the plan was to uh, shut down and close the site there in Shoreline, um, but the two large tents um, by the end of June or so. And I'm seeing in this chart in the application that we are apparently in negotiations to extend that lease. So I would wonder, I'm wondering what the actual um, status of that is and plan for that site is because we communicated out to the public that that was the schedule based on confirmations across the executive branch about that. And if there's been a change, I guess I'd like to know about it so we can understand it and communicate it. Uh, two, on the application, um, I'm kind of interested because I've, I have two of these, at least in my district, these large indoor recreational facilities, one being an ice rink in Shoreline, the other being a large tennis, indoor tennis facility at Magnuson Sandpoint. And I think with respect to tennis in here, it says you can have maybe up to five folks uh, indoors um, and I'm wondering, is that per court or is that in a whole facility and kind of what the, the thinking is there? Um, and then third on testing, and this is more of a big picture issue. I have to say, I feel like we are losing our moral authority to the extent moral authority is the right one, public health authority with respect to these fairly um, rigid business controls in light of what everybody is seeing in, in America on, on these very, I think, well taken, and I've participated in a number of them, protests on civil rights where you have 60,000 people marching in close proximity. Uh, we have on Capitol Hill in a few blocks, you know, regular uh, kind of almost, well, a regular presence of a lot of folks. And I'm just wondering, kind of big picture as a government, how we tell constituents that your restaurant or your small business must remain closed or at limited occupancy uh, when they when we see that those kind of large congregate populations on the street and a corollary to that if that would continue I would hope our health department if it made sense could bring some mobile testing capacity uh, to those to those uh, large events including particularly the, the chop or the chaz whatever we're calling it now in Capitol Hill which is great I've been so there's a, a number of questions and a suggestion. 
Can I take a couple, a crack at a couple of those, and then I'll uh, rely on Kirsten and Dennis to jump in as well. Um, on the ACRC question, I think you are right, Council Member. So we need to go back and check that. I, I'm not sure, but um, I, I think what you have flagged may be correct. So we will take that back and double check it because uh, my understanding was similar to yours. Um, Second, on the indoor fitness, um, we are asking for clarification from the state on that as well. Um, I will flag that there is, you know, a big difference between indoor and outdoor with ventilation and that kind of stuff. And I'm, I am no public health official, so I can't speak to that directly. Um, but we, it, it is a question we have also had. And so we are seeking some additional clarification, um, on that. And, um, and then, uh, to the third question, I think, you know, again, we are working in that state frame of trying to do the most that we can that has been allowed to us uh, currently, but also um, hearing your uh, and, and uh, board member Lambert's both sort of talking about testing and hearing that as an imperative and something that we need to do. I will say we are, because testing has been limited, we have really tried to focus it um, in the places where there's disproportionate disease burden. Um, but I think we also need to be mindful of where there's disproportionate activity happening. And so that is something as we, uh, Dennis and team and I kind of work through what that additional testing um, regimen could look like in King County, um, we absolutely should be taking that into consideration. And Dennis, I don't, Kirsten, I don't know if you have anything to add there, but. Yeah, I'll just add a couple things. Uh, I think you covered it well. I think testing is, you know, I will say it's been our Achilles heel through this whole response. Um, from the very beginning to current. And uh, it's getting better. We're in a much, much better place than we have been uh, in the last few months. Uh, I think one of the things that's been really wonderful is that we've been working really closely with our community health centers. Where are, they're embedded in the community, they are involved in the community and, uh, and really trying to push our capacities through them, uh, through contracts and making sure they have the testing supplies in order to be able to do the work that they're doing. So that's really helped make a big improvement on the ground. Um, the other piece that I would just, you know, highlight is um, over the weekend, uh, there was uh, a lot of very large mobile, our mobile testing or testing available in the community as part of this uh, Black Lives Matters and uh, some of the protests and making sure that we're getting uh, testing out. Uh, this weekend, uh, the two or three uh, sites that were set up did over 1,200 tests of people who have been pretty actively involved in the community and, and to Rachel's responses, making sure that we're responsive to also where the activity is happening. So. I think we're making roads there and we're, you know, every every two days, every couple of days a week, we're looking about where are the hot spots, where do we need to get testing, what's the strategy and getting it there. Just, I wanna go back to one other thing on testing uh, uh, for Council Member Lambert is we do actually have testing that's not reflected on this particular sheet, but I know that we have been working closely with East County as well. Uh, Harborview over in Issaquah uh, site, the UW Medical Center in Issaquah has been really, really supportive and working very closely with us as well as some of the CHCs over there as well. So uh, we do have some testing capacity and trying to increase that as well. The only thing I would add is um, the indoor fitness does have some language around tennis and the size of the group, not to be more than five, but that both singles and doubles and instruction is available. So yeah, we always look to that DOH website. Thank you. And, and just so on clarification for the indoor tennis facilities, and there are a number of them around the county, most of them have multiple courts. So do we know whether, you know, is that four or five per court? So if you had, you know, four in a, in a building or warehouse, would it be 20? How do we explain that to the, to the public? Or is that something we need to follow up with the State Department of Health on what they mean? Yeah, I think following up with the state. Oh, okay. And then I appreciate all those answers and maybe just a little plug to if it made sense epidemiologically to have our mobile van or a testing site up on uh, Capitol Hill between 10th and 12th on Pine. I think we might do a fair bit of business and maybe do some good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And actually, can I just add, uh, sorry to interrupt, um, but I just wanted to, I just um, have a note here confirmed that you are correct, the Shoreline ACRC we will update the application to say that the lease ends at June and there was no extension contemplated. It just hadn't been updated. Uh -oh. it was um, So nice catch and thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Rachel. And, and let me be clear. I think that the shoreline community to the very large degree 
uh, if it was requested to, would have extended. I wasn't, uh, didn't want to advocate for closure. We just wanted to be clear in communication. They've been terrific partners and hosts. Yes, and thank you for your leadership on that and for facilitating that, and they have been wonderful partners. Thank you. And, Ken, thank you. and Board Member Dombowski, your advocacy for additional resources to my district is always welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, it, I couldn't tell if it was Council Member Zahalai's or yours. I didn't remember where the line was, but uh, it's a it's a, something kind of cool happening there. It really is. Um, board members on. Yes, thank you. Um, so I echo a lot of the comments, um, especially about East King County, because when I look at the list, we do have ICHS and CMAR in Bellevue, and yet they're not on the list of um, testing centers. So I'd really like to suggest that we're not looking for even new locations. We already have existing ones. And in addition to that, I've gotten some outreach from Bellevue College about a lot of students do not have insurance. And so to the degree that we have a lot of students that are out protesting, you know, they would also like to understand where some of the testing centers might be. And I did get some a response back from Cali Knight that there are places that they can go for free testing. Uh, but it would be nice to actually have that published somewhere so it's not a um, calling in to get information. So I think those are things that are important. Um, I'm excited that we're moving to phase two. I think that from a King County Board of Health standpoint, to the degree that we can start looking ahead to say, where are the gaps for us to move to phase three? So we're not always chasing, we're actually being proactive and looking ahead. Because I do think that, although I appreciate the fact that the framework was established at the governor's office, um, to the degree that we can be looking at safety preparedness based decision making. So, um, if businesses or industries are more ready because they have the tools, they have the PPE, they've been able to successfully demonstrate what does reopening fully look like then I think we need to be doing that advocacy at the state level. Um, I mentioned this last week that in construction, right, all construction is able to continue because there were rules put in place about how you'd be able to uh, be fully open. So what would that look like for these different categories of business? And how do we go about doing the state advocacy to make that happen? because we are losing uh, our small businesses. They're concerned about their survival. And I understand now that there, there is PPE, mask, and various things available to businesses. So if they're ready, then let's figure out how to help them move to that next step. So I guess those were my, my thoughts. And then my last comment is, I thought I'd heard that in, with some of the testing, they're able to get results faster than two days. I've heard that you can get it within, you know, eight hours. So is that type of testing just not as available or they're, they're less accurate? Can you help with that? So thank you. So I'll take the first two and then I'll pass it over to Dennis uh, for any uh, additions, clarifications, or um, and to answer your third question. So uh, one, we absolutely can update the list and make sure that we're clear on where the existing uh, testing facilities are um, and potentially do that even by region or something like that. So we'll, we'll update that. And then as we add um, uh, additional sites, we will make sure that we do that. Um, on the... Um, uh, excuse me, on the second question, um, sorry, remind me of the second question you had asked. Uh, was that, so I talked about the students. Um, I talked about really safety preparedness based. Oh, right, yes. Sorry. And advocacy at the state level. I actually couldn't read the, the note that I just scribbled here while you were talking. I apologize for that. I did want to say, um, you, the approach that you have just framed out is actually one that we have thought about a lot um, at the county as well, which is really sort of in the checklist space, if you will, like showing I can do this and I can do this, therefore I can perform this safely. Um, and we do understand from the governor's office that for phase three, they are moving to that checklist model instead of the um, really, really detailed guidance model. I don't think that they have thought sort of all the way through exactly what that's going to look like. So to your point about being able to 
um, provide, um, you know, sort of basic information on how our businesses are able or not able to respond to various things. I am sure that that could inform how they develop um, those that those policy checklists. Um, but that sort of overall approach is one that we at King County have supported a lot and will continue um, to do so as we think about moving into phase three. So, and then Dennis, I don't know if you can speak yeah. to the same time. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple things on the testing uh, time time frame of getting a test results back. So it's just a matter of getting the collection pulled and getting it to the lab to get tested. It, it, it's easily to get it done within 24 hours if you have plenty of capacity in order to do that. Uh, so it's mostly a volume issue uh, of being able to get those back in a, in, a, in a quick and timely way. But generally, you see a lot of labs, uh, that especially our local labs, that are able to do that within a 24-hour period of time. There's another test that's out there that was approved uh, through uh, Abbott, and it's called a point of care test. And it's actually done oftentimes mm -hmm. within a, a hospital environment. We, we piloted it within our uh, uh, gel uh, here in order to do it. The challenge with that was, uh, is that the supplies are just not readily available. And you have to go through the federal government in order to get them. And when we received three, three uh, um, mechanisms to be able to do the test, the actual equipment, we only received 24, uh, uh, 24 examples of that we could actually run a test on. And we have not received any more mm -hmm. uh, kits. So part of that is just a really challenge to get those testing kits for the point of care. So more advocacy. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. I, I see Mayor Baker's um, video come on, but I'm going to interrupt and Mr. Warsham, we were taking questions following um, Ms. Weissen's presentation. Were you also going to make a presentation? I, I'm just here to hang out with you. So any questions that come up, I'm uh, I'm I'm the, the last <laughs> on the totem pole here if to answer any questions. Dennis, I always love hanging out with you. <laughs> I have a question, Cole Wells. Um, gotcha, Cole Wells. One moment. Um, board member Baker, did you have a question? Nope, no question. Just, just wanted to see. make sure that you knew I was here. Great. Board member um, Cole Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have to say, Mayor Baker looks pretty sharp with his beard. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't seen that before. It's called laziness. <laughs> I like it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank and you. the report was really, I mean, the application material is really excellent. I'm very eager to use it for my e-news. Do you have any anticipation of when this is likely to be uh, approved by the state? Well, presuming a uh, positive vote by all of you here today, um, we would be able to get the material submitted um, uh, I think this afternoon, um, Kirsten, correct me if I'm wrong there, but we would get it in today. And then the state has typically been in the 24 to 72 hour range to review that paperwork um, and approve it. And so presuming that they stick to that timeline, um, we, we would be uh, sort of open and ready for business under the phase two criteria um, just a little bit later this week. Thank you. And may I follow up, Mr. Chair? Um, please, but I point out, Ms. Smith, that that application is also contingent on sign off by the county executive. Oh. I think he's going to support it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Rachel, if by chance our situation worsened and we had more of a surge that was significant, what what would be the plan then? We voluntarily would step back, or would there have to be a, another? Exec, county executive, rather, Jeff Dushin, having to uh, make another directive? Sure, and this is, uh, answering this question is very likely to get me into trouble, so I do want Dennis to <laughs> stop me if I say anything wrong here, but I think, um, yes, Dr. Dushin certainly has the authority at any time to manage um, the community, uh, to manage the disease in any way that he uh, believes is necessary as the public health officer. And of course, public health orders are, are law. So um, mm -hmm. he has that authority and can do that. I think that um, I, I, I would uh, presume that the spirit though of the cautiousness with which we have taken each step uh, means that we feel great, great um, comfort in where we are in not needing to take those steps backwards. I think, and this is just sort of being candid here, I do think that there 
we're going to need to, to look and see how long we need to be in phase two. Um, you know, there is a minimum of three weeks set, not just by the state from a process perspective, but I think by our health officials at DOH and public mm -hmm. health to allow um, with this, this level of increased activity to allow us to see like the full incubation period for the disease and then some to really see how that impacts the community and what happens in terms of outbreaks. Um, so I would suspect that it will be more a conversation of how long we need to stay in each phase um, here in King County because of how well we've done than it is how we may need to backtrack. Um, but that said, Dr. Duchin has, does have that authority. And I think for some other counties, um, board member Colwell's where um, there has not been um, maybe as much uh, sort of supportive compliance with public health directors, the Department of Health uh, Secretary has reserved his right to move into those counties and uh, actually pull them back or not allow them to go further uh, because of our very close relationship with Department of Health and their officials and our officials in, in health. Uh, I don't see that ever being a situation that we would have happen here in King County. But Thank you very, you thank you very much. And just one suggestion, uh, I would, I ask that perhaps you uh, make data plural in the text of the application. It is a plural word. Noted. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did, did you want to add anything to what I said there? Well, I think uh, I keep telling Rachel we're giving her uh, honorary PhD in uh, public health. She has really been amazing uh, in being uh, able to talk about this so 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 well. Just a couple of things I just want to point out that I think are important, just from a public health perspective is you know, we kind of have two, two tools at hand that we're really trying to do here. And you know, there's, there's a mitigation strategy, which is like all the messages about you know, wear your mask when you go out, socially distance, you know, and really do everything you can to mitigate your chance of exposure uh, of somebody who may be infected or if you're infected of exposing somebody else. The other one that you see in this application that is really clear is we're really trying to do the suppression or really the containment. So the work around our contact investigations and our case investigations is really about trying to interrupt that virus as quickly as we can so it infects less people. So in what we, when we first came out, we did a really strong containment and we had to abandon that and go to mitigation of socially distancing, people telecommuting and a variety of other things that are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. As we come back into this phase two and really trying to open up the economy, we're trying to do a blend of both. And I think that we're it's a calculated effort that it, we hope we can do both well and that it's gonna really keep our numbers low. But as Rachel very nicely said, is if, there, if it doesn't go well, we may need to slide more back to some stronger mitigation strategies if the containment isn't working like we hope it's working. So we're calculating that every day, trying to make the decisions based on where we need to do. And the reason we do a strong mitigation is because we're trying to keep that hospital capacity free and we don't overload our hospitals. Uh, and we're in a good spot for that right now but we really do need to pull these other things around our containment, around contact tracing and investigations, as well as getting testing more widely available. And the other thing on testing, I just wanna put out, and I think Rachel's correct, we, need, we can get something better out about all the places we're doing testing, but in this application is specific to where we have free testing. And that's why it's a limited set that's in the application, but it isn't reflective of everywhere who's doing testing within uh, King County. And, so it's kind of two different things. And so we can get something out, as Rachel said, something on a more regional level uh, to all of you so you know where testing is actually happening. Mr. Chair. Further questions, um, board member Lambert. Thank you. Um, I'm sitting here sort of chewing on my fingernails. Um, how do we go about making my district a carnival city so that we can encourage the people to come to our stores um, now, um, like it's happening on CHOP. Can we have WAP or something EOP so that we too can open up on the east side of the county? Um, I'm not even asking for 60,000 people. I'm asking for a couple of hundred to be able to come and keep our stores alive. So <laughs> I'm, 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 my blood pressure is going up, let's say that. Um, I, I am emotionally being impacted by people who are calling me and telling me I am losing everything I've ever had in my life. And another three weeks, I will have lost it all. And it's hard to hear people after people after people telling me their stories. 
when they say, look what's happening on TV and nobody's doing a thing about that. And yet we can't open our stores and keep our livelihood together. So can you explain to me how, how that is fair and how I can make an EOP so I can have a carnival city in my district? Member Lambert, um, I don't know who your question was addressed to, um, but I but I want to remind us all that our work here is based on um, public health and wanting to have the strongest response possible to address public health and respond in a public health fashion to protect um, everyone's health. And I, I'm aware. Um, you have some concerns about the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, um, but that hasn't been encouraged by public health. Um, and we want to set out strong guidelines for public health for to contain the pandemic and do our best work there. So, not to argue with you at all, but the sad thing is that if my people chose to be choose, chose to have not be law abiding, not follow this in an area where some of them have had less than 10 positive cases and they have the strictest um, requirements. It, it's just, I, I can't explain it with a straight face. Um, it's just not fair. So I, I don't want to see my constituents' livelihoods be lost. Um, and, and maybe the answer is that they need to have an EHOP. Um, and, and do it that way. Um, it's frustrating that some people have one set of rules and some people have another set of rules. And I get that we want people to be healthy and that we're trying the very best we can, but over and over, and I've been writing for weeks to the governor and to public health saying, please don't let this happen. With numerous ideas, less than 20 cases, um, less than 10,000 in population, less than this, less than that as a number of different ways that we could open fairly, but um, this is not my idea of opening fairly. So uh, I, I'm frustrated, I guess I should say. Board member, I hear your frustration. Um, and I think we all feel for and want economic recovery and small businesses um, to be able to open and large businesses to employ individuals who have been laid off and are losing um, financial income right now. Um, and yet I need to remind everyone that there is one set of guidelines. Um, we, do, we have not established a um, unique set for any particular part of our community. There is one set because we're one community dealing with a pandemic across our community. And, uh, Mr. Chair. Board member um, Dombrowski. Thank you. Um, I, I hear Councilmember Lambert's uh, pain expressed on behalf of her constituents, and I think you know there's a reasonable dialogue to be had. But just so the record is clear and there isn't confusion, um, I did visit the Capitol Hill zone, whatever we want to call it now, and and the businesses there are, from my observation, following the exact same rules as businesses anywhere else in the county. So. The cafes and restaurants were doing takeout, right? The the Elliott Bay bookstore was doing curbside pickup. They're not open. I, I, and many of the other businesses like the clubs um, are closed. Um, so I, I, I don't want, based on this conversation, which I think is worth having, but I, I don't think people should be left with the impression that the rules in place by the our Board of Health, our health department in the state, are not being applied uniformly. That was my observation having visited there. Okay. Further questions? Um, that, I'm sorry, board member Honda. Thank you. Um, I have three questions. One is when this is approved, how soon does it go into effect? Is it immediate as soon as the governor approves it? Um, does it have to be three weeks before we can move into the next phase? And King County is such a large county. Is it possible that King County could be broken into regions and each region apply um, separately to phase three or the, the following phases? 
Uh, great questions and happy to answer them. Um, so uh, question one, how quickly can we move into phase two? Uh, literally, as soon as we get the green light from the state, we are in phase two. So uh, those businesses or gatherings or uh, uh, fitness or whatever uh, can immediately begin that activity as soon as they're ready. Um, second question uh, was... Um, Third question was around breaking up. Second question was, sorry, board member. Um, just look at my note here. Um, I was around being in phase two for uh, three weeks. Oh, right, thank you, sorry. Uh, so, and we, we are required to be in phase two a minimum of three weeks. Um, and that uh, is both in the state required process. Um, and I, I think speaking on behalf of public, <laughs> Courage, uh, saying that that is a minimum amount of time to see the disease sort of land in that period of time. And then uh, we have not uh, been given any um, indication by the governor's office that we would be able to uh, move into, um, into any other regions. They have based all of their work on the uh, local health uh, jurisdictions, um, the LHJs, if you will, is how they have defined that work. So um, uh, to my knowledge, we would not be able to do that. Further questions? I'm seeing no further questions. So I would um, recognize board member DeLucky to move adoption of the resolution if he was so inclined. Yes, I would like to move resolution 20-09 to uh, forward to the board. This is David. Approval. Second. It's been uh, moved and seconded that we adopt um, resolution 2009. Um, Dr. Delucky, can I ask you to also move to attach the final application as received um, at 3.42 um, p.m.? with the corrections of making data plural and the correction to the shoreline um, expiration date. Uh, yes, you may. I would like to move forward the uh, application that uh, was presented to the board at 3.42 uh, p.m. this afternoon, uh, including corrections uh, to the document that was discussed by board members on this call. And um, thank you. Take it from there. <laughs> we, we have an amendment before us to attach the final application as, as amended, if you will. Um, is there a discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, I call for a voice vote um, on the amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Is there discussion on the resolution as amended? I would like to thank uh, Ms. Smith, Ms. Weissen, and uh, Mr. Warsham for their um, presentations and their work in putting the application together today for walking us through it and um, for Dr. Dushin for his recommendation to take this up and consider it. Um, I also would be remiss if I did not also thank the um, people of King County for doing the work it has taken um, since the emergency and pandemic were declared to be at a place where we can be considering um, this step moving to phase two in what is admittedly a four step, four phase um, process um, to come out of our quarantine. And with that, and seeing no further discussion, I would ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Chair. Board Member Colwells. Aye. Board Member Lambert. Aye. Board Member Lewis. Board Member Morales. Board Member Mosqueda. Board Member Baker. Aye. Board Member Honda. Aye. Board Member Daniel. Aye. Board Member Delecki. Aye. Mr. Chair. Aye. Mr. Chair, the vote is 10 ayes and board members Lewis, Morales, and Mosqueda excused. Thank you. Um, having received the required majority, 
um, resolution 2009 as amended has been adopted. I wanna thank everybody for joining us for this special meeting of the Board of Health, being a special meeting and nothing further on our agenda. Um, we will, uh, we are adjourned. I look forward to seeing everyone again um, virtually for our regularly scheduled meeting this Thursday. Thank you everyone.